Well, welcome back, everyone. I can't see the meeting room, so I don't know if we're ready to start yet. I think as we're past the start time, I'll crack on. Uh, welcome to this first session of the Fifth World Weather Congress, uh, which will consider the global view on livestock, raw stock, and value chains and supply chains. And as we've seen in the past year or so, these are critical areas for our industry. And I'm delighted that we have three industry recognized experts on these matters speaking here today. So for this session, I'm gonna first introduce all the speakers. Uh, each speaker will then give their presentation. And after all the presentations have been given, there'll be some time for questions and answer. So our first speaker this morning is uh, Mr. Steve Sotman. He, in his role as president of the Leather and Hide Council of America, Stephen represents and promotes the interests of the US hide, skin and leather industry before a wide range of stakeholders, including US and foreign governments, industry trade associations, media outlets and other organisations related to global leather production and trade. He was appointed to this role in 2013 after serving as director of international affairs for the same uh, um, company for three years. Prior to joining LHCA, Steve worked as a member of the legislative staff of the United States Senator Evan Bay from Indiana, covering a broad range of economic issues, including international trade and agriculture. A native of the state of Indiana, Steve received a Bachelor of Arts from Purdue University, a Master of Business Administration from Indiana University Kelly School of Business, and a Juris Doctor from Indiana University Robert H. McKinney School of Law. He will be presenting on the relation of leather to the livestock and meat industry. Unfortunately, due to travel restrictions and time difference between Ethiopia and the United States, Steve's presentation has been pre-recorded and he will not be available to answer any questions. Our next speaker will be Mr. Wandu Lejez Shizor, uh, National Project Coordinator for UNIDO in Ethiopia. Uh, Mr. Wandu has a Master's of Business Industry Administration from the International Leadership Institute of Ethiopia, a postgraduate diploma in leather processing technology in the central leather research industry uh, in Chennai, India, and a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry from Addis Ababa uh, University in Ethiopia. Currently, he is working as project coordinator for UNIDO for a project titled Leather Initiative for Sustainable Employment Creation. He has previously served as Director General, Department Head, Head of Research and Consultant Expert uh, on Leather Technology at the Ethiopian Leather Industry Development Institute. Uh, he has also worked as a Senior Leather Expert in Marshall Tannery. As a member of the National Export Council Steering Committee, led by the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Mr. Wandu has also contributed in the development of the Ethiopia leather sector and has played a role in the development of numerous other organisations, including the National Standard Council uh, of Ethiopia and as a member of the Board of Directors for the African Leather and Leather Product Institute. Mr. Wandu will be speaking about the footwear and leather goods global perspective. Our final speaker for this session will be Mr. Luca Boltri, Vice Head of the Economic Department at the Italian Tanners Association, uh, sorry, Vice Director and Head of the Economic Department at the Italian Association, UNICH. Luca is Vice Director of the uh, UNICH, uh, representative body of the Italian Tanning Association, which covers over 60% of the European sector in terms of leather production, turnover and companies. He has responsibilities in all the fields in which the organisation provides services, including economic intelligence, international projects and relationships, social dialogue, sustainability, legal affairs, industrial policy, trade affair organisation, including Lydia Pelli in Milan. Luca holds a master's degree in business and law administration at Bocconi University in Milan and previously worked for the Italian trade agency ICE and for the World Bank. He has been working for UNICH since 2000. And today, Luca will be speaking about leather in the world of luxury. So if I could hand over to the team in Addis for the first presentation from Steve Sotman, please. Uh, good morning. Could someone from the technical team at, in Addis Ababa let me know whether the video is playing because no one can hear it online. Hello, Dr. Kerry. Hello, Professor. Do you hear us? I do you hear you now. I, yes, I have done my, uh, carry on, sorry. I am hearing you. Uh, uh, normally it was uh, Mr. Sotman from the US was to make uh, the video. His video is a bit, uh, our IT is getting challenged. Can I switch to Dr. Wondu? If he's available, the, let's do that, yes. The second speaker. 
then yeah. you can introduce the Mr. Wong and uh, we'll, uh, we'll start with him while they are sorting out uh, the other video. Okay, I've, I've been through an introduction already. Is uh, that not heard? Pardon? I've been through an introduction for the speakers already. Very good. Then let me invite Mr. Wondu to take the floor. Let you invite him. Okay, in that, uh, in that case, I'm very happy to invite Mr. Wondu Lejes Chizor uh, to speak to us on the subject of uh, footwear in the global supply chain. Hello, uh, good evening. I will continue to present my presentation. My presentation is based on the footwear on global perspective. And all the sources come from the World Footwear Year, that is for 2020 latest data. And this will show how the World Footwear and laser products are uh, going on. So in my presentation, I will touch the production part, the latest part, how the COVID-19 affects the production, the consumption, and also the exporters, and how it will go for the future also. I will present it in my presentation. The uh, also dynamics of the uh, laser products and for, for the production, the uh, pandemic severely hit the footwear business with global footwear production in 2020, falling by almost falling by almost four billion over the previous over the previous year, and production, and production by, fell by eight in 2020. That is wiping, that is wiping away, all away all the growth accumulated the over the last ten years. Asia till, Asia now, till now, Asia almost nine, nine out of every, every ten pairs of shoes and, and one jet worldwide and increased, increased by zero by zero point two percent points. And Africa, and Africa also, also original original increased of the world expense of North and South America is a share being only nine and more more the industry. And uh, when we see the consumption, doesn't go. Sorry, the, now when we see the production and uh, Asia still eighty seven point six percent of footwear production is coming from Asia. And uh, South, South America, America is 4.6, Europe, so 3.2, and Africa, 3.1%. North America is 1.5%. Oceania, almost a contribution. Uh, when we come to consumption, the effect of COVID-19 and the strength, the stronger impact on food consumption in the advanced economies of so North America and Europe than any in other parts of the world, the gap between the average per capita consumption of footwear in North America is spread from 4 pairs in 2019 only to 2.8 pairs in 2020. And consumption per capita per also, per also failed only in Europe, Europe Virginia, but, but much, less, much less, less, less in Asia, Asia, Asia and South, South America. Therefore, the, 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 the geographic distribution of footwear. Consumption in 2020 was ever before, before to the distribution of the population. Uh, when, when we, we see, see consumption, consumption here, is, here is the data, data. Asia consumes 55.88% of the total production. production. South America, America is 5.88%. Europe, Europe 30.6% consumption. consumption. Africa is 8.9%. North America 13.1 and Oceania 0.8% uh, of consumption is there. Uh, 
Now, when we come to the export, the COVID-19 pandemic disrupted international value chains, leading to a reduction of the percentage of production. Twelve point one billion pairs are exported all over the world. Asia is the origin of most of the footwear exported, but the share of the world total has been slowly declining over the last 10 years, and this trend continues in 2020. The same is happening with every other continent, but Europe, share of world exports has increased by almost five percentage points since 2011. This is by, by within 10 years, the percentage of Europe increases by 4%. <clears throat> And the volume of footwear exported in 2020, as I mentioned before, 12.1 12, 12 billion pairs, was 19% lower than in the previous season. When you compare with 2019, it is 90% lower than the previous year, and then lowest in the last 10 years. This export performance, 12.1 billion, is one of the lowest in the, in the last 10 years because it was an increasing when you see from the 2011 until 2020 it was an increasing pattern but at the, uh, the, in 2019 at equal amount of 2011 now it will go down the export is decreasing 14 These negative trends were common to all categories of footwear. That is the categories of footwear, whether it is leather, rubbers, and also textile footwear. This is the same. And geographically, the disruption was wider with the fall, ranging from only 9% in Europe, thanks to the resilience of intra-European trade, 13% in North America, and 31% in America, South America. And when we see the continent, uh, still Asia is leading. In 2011, the share of Asia was 84%, but in 2.3. Europe, 11.4, now 15.1%. North America from 1.8 go down to 0.9%. South America from 1.2 to 0.9%. Africa from 1.6%, it will come to 0.8%. This uh, decrease uh, export value for the in terms of continent. When we see the imports, as in the case of consumption over the last decade, geographical patterns of footwear import have been changing. And now when you see the previous time, North America was from one of the importer, the big importer, but this trend is changing. Over the last decade, the, ge the geographical dispersion of footwear importers has grown considerably with the share of the top 10 countries. The world total falling from 59% of export in 2011 to 48% in 2020. The share of the world top importer, the USA has fallen the most from 22.24% to 17.5%. The list of the top 10 footwear is also decreasing. Importers include seven European countries led by Germany, which collectively represent 23% of world import. For the time in 2020, China entered the lead for the first time. China entered into 10 most importer, importer, importers from the, from the world. Now 2.1 share is to China. Previously, China exports all over the world. Now China starts also importing shoe and also enter to the top 10 countries of importing in 2020. This is for the first time.
when we see the price trend list, even though there is a reduction of uh, production and also export, in terms of value, there is no much, much decrease. Uh, even at some stage, it's, it shows a growing of at an average of 3.3% a year since 2011. In 2020, even, it, this is double to 6%. Even the production volume is less, but in terms of price grows accelerated to 6%, with the average price exceeding $10 for the first time in the last 10 years. The, the average price was less than $10, but now in this 2020, it will become $20. And the other is the world is now clearly divided into three, three areas of uh, markets. That is footwear export prices, $25, with the highest one, Europe and Oceania. And the other is uh, American. And the least is Africa and also South America. Is the least price that is less than $7. The evolution of the... It will not go too fast, sorry, for the system. Uh, the next. When we see the continental flows, the close economic integration across. Please back. The close economic integration across the continents, if you see all continents, European footwear is intra trade. European, it's 6% of the production for. European countries is they are uh, exported from one European country to the other. This, is a, this creates for them a very good market because any transportation and also as of doing business between these countries is very easy. And next is uh, when you see intra continental trade also dominates North America, 71%. Is there when you, when you come to this one for Asia? And the intra trade is very less, and 70% of the production for Asian countries is exported to the world. And in Africa, the intra trade is only 40%, 60% of their production is exported to other countries. When we see the product mix between 2011 and 2018, and the production specifically for textile laser is increasing in, in high amount and the laser, the laser product is, is almost constant, but the value is almost, it is before 10 years, it is constant and the rubber and textile is very increasing, but when you compare with rubber this and textile, the textile uh, footwear is increasing until 2019, but in 2020, even the textile footwear is, was decreasing. However, the value share of this category product has kept increasing, implying that its average price is on the rise. In the same period, laser footwear slightly increases its volume share, seeming to have reversed the downward trend. That uh, for the last 10 years, the laser footwear was in a downward trend, but in 2020, it seems it, it uh, increases their the share of the laser footwear. The same happened with rubber and plastic footwear. The importance of the other categories of product is more. Although the category is often associated with low-cost products, the rise in textile footwear exports 
when the textile footwear starts, the price for the, the footwear was very less. But now the average price for footwear is also increasing more than $14. That means the in terms of technology and other things, there are a satisfaction of the consumers to buy or to shift to the textile footwear. So it is increasing. But when it, it starts, it was slow or low. Leather footwear is the only category carrying the much higher price of $26.29. That is an average for the whole export of the leather. Asia and Europe, the two continents responsible for 97% of all footwear exports show considering the different trends with regard to the main categories of product. Europe has traditionally specialized in leather footwear paying less attention to rubber and plastic and even less to textile footwear. That means the contribution of Europe for the rubber and also textile shoe is very small. And the majority share is from Asian countries, Vietnam and also China. In Asia, on the other hand, at the start of the decade, rubber and plastic accounted for 59% of export textile 19% and laser for 14%. The share of laser footwear hardly changed through that decade, but the share of textile footwear increased to 13% as I discussed before. And who are the big players, manufacturers in the international market? Europe's largest producer, Italy, when we previously, especially for the laser footwear, it stands for top 10 countries, but now Italy is changed to 13th. This is due to a severe COVID-19 effect, but after this, we don't know, it will come again to the top 10 countries. And from these 20 most important footwear producers, there are five, six African countries also included in here. And Within 99 million pairs of shoe production per year, Ethiopia is also on standards for certain uh, rank for the top 20 producers of footwear. Okay, next. And uh, in this way, after discussing all the trends, the global trend, I want to speak some pointers on the Africa, Africa, especially on the laser and laser product side. I give to Africa is the ignore frontier in all terms, ignoring ignorance from the uh, ours itself and also from the policymakers, from the institutions. And there is a lot of potential, but still we are not going well and the potential for africa is we can increase the, our production is very less and now we have a share of only 1.5 percent but we can do a lot of things to increase this 1.5 share in terms of production we consume less that is 10.9 percent when you compare with others and this co consumption is also includes the production which is produced locally and also imported 10.9 we can we can increase the livelihood of the people to increase the consumption per per capita and export is only now 0.8 percent there are a lot of a lot of rooms to, to to increase this one when we see the price now is our price of in average is less than seven dollar product mix is focused only on product mix that means our product is very less only on laser side mostly but the non-laser part is not still untouched and intracontinental trade is very small when you compare with other continents so these are the potentials for africa and we have to change this in a near time
And what are the challenges to compete in the global competition, quality of raw material, environment, industrial support, import substitution? These are the main challenges. If we have to work on these parts, we can change the trend. Next. Thank you, Mr. Wandu, for that uh, very interesting presentation on the status of the uh, global industry and also the insights for the African industry. And we can all agree that the potential in Africa is there to be exploited. I have Steve Sothman's presentation uh, on my uh, laptop. I'm going to attempt to play that now if I can share my screen. Hi, good morning, and, and thank you all for inviting me here today to speak to the Fifth World Leather Congress. Uh, I, I, I'm Steve Southman. I'm the president of the Leather and Hide Council of America, and I must say I'm, I'm very sad I was not able to travel with you this for a very long time. So let me just go ahead and start our discussion today by talking about uh, global livestock and, and meat trends. And, and I'll say this area, uh, I could do a presentation on this uh, for three hours, right? There, there's, there's a lot happening in the world, obviously, and especially in, in, in livestock and meat. So what I'm going to try to do is give you a very, very high level uh, perspective of, of some of the major trends that are taking place around the world. So first, let's look at uh, what, what's being produced. What, how much meat is being produced around the world? Well, uh, since about year 2000, we have expanded uh, quite a bit the, the amount of meat we produce globally. Uh, but the vast majority of that growth is really coming from two main proteins. It's come from our uh, pig meats, uh, swine, swine production, and also from chicken production. Chicken production and poultry production around the world has increased significantly over the last couple decades. So, uh, pig meat now, now accounts for about 35% of all protein availability, animal proteins, 33% is, is about chicken, and only about 20% is uh, from cow. And that stayed relatively the same uh, over that two-decade period. We haven't seen a lot of growth um, in, the, in the cattle and beef production side, um, even though I think popular, popular dynamics and, and, and popular stories from the media would, would make you think that we are just exponentially growing the number of cattle in the world, but that's, that's just not the case. Uh, we have grown our, our the, the amount of meat available in the world pretty substantially um, and to meet, uh, to meet a growing population globally. 
you know, if you look at where a lot of our meat is being produced around the world right now, uh, well, Asia. Asia is the largest uh, producer of, of meat in the world. And, and again, a lot of that is pri primarily swine and pork. Uh, that, that's uh, coming out of China and, 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 and greater China region. That's one of the mar largest producers of, of meat in the world. Uh, Europe, North America, relatively the same over a, a many decades in terms of the amount of meat being produced. It has uh, fluctuated up and down, but uh, fairly similar to, to where it's been in the last couple of decades. South America has increased uh, a fair amount, uh, especially in, in Brazil and Argentina, Uruguay, uh, in, in the amount of uh, animal proteins they're producing. And then Africa, uh, as you can see, is, is, is starting to, to build its, its protein sector as well. So not quite as large as some other uh, areas of the world, but it is growing. So if we turn now to, I'm, I'm going to focus a lot on cattle production, uh, just because of the relationship between cattle production production and leather industry, uh, the leather industry. So I'm going to focus on that today, uh, but obviously we have, there, there's a lot of stories, a lot of trends happening in, in, in smaller skins and sheep production going on. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, we have a lot of growth in the economy. We have a lot of growth in the economy. We have a lot of growth in the economy. We have a lot of growth in the economy. Which does a fantastic job of estimating global cattle herds and meat availability and things like that. Uh, the difference, though, is if, if you look at FAO data, uh, they have estimates that are also very consistent in terms of the number of cattle available uh, globally, but their estimates are consistently about 250 million or 300 million head higher than the USDA. So they move in the same uh, they move in the same way over time, but they just estimate the total number to be different. Obviously, if you're going to try to count the number of cattle in the world, it gets very difficult in certain countries where it can be very rural. There's just not the infrastructure in place to really uh, to really have accurate statistics. So that's uh, that's where you, you find a lot of the, the disparity in the data. If I focus in on, on certain regions and where where growth is happening in, in cattle supply, specifically in regions, a lot of regions around the world have been fairly stable. Uh, really, the only exception for that is this yellow line, which is South American herd. So Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, uh, you've seen their herd grow a fair amount over the last two decades, uh, going from something like 240 million head, 250 million head, to up over 300 million head, largely at, at, in commercial beef production. Uh, but for other regions, Europe, US, uh, uh, other, uh, Oceania, or Oceania the, the herds are, are relatively the same over that same time period. I haven't included Africa in this data set because I, 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 I did have uh, data for Africa here, but the data was all over the place. And I, I don't think it was very good uh, data and it went down quite significantly one year. So I haven't included that, but um, I, I, I would be surprised if there was, uh, if, if, if the African region was different than a lot of the other regions in the world for cattle production. So if we just focus on the US, for example, uh, my, my home country, what we're seeing in our cattle inventory, well, we were in a growth phase for much of the, the, the 20th century up until the 1970s when we peaked in the number of cattle we had in the U.S. 1975 was the most cattle we had, 132 million head. Since then, we've been slowly coming down. And since around the year 2000, we really have kind of uh, uh, stabilized at, at a, a level of about 94, 95 million head of cattle. That goes up and down a little bit every year, depending on where we are in the cattle cycle. Cattle cycles are about eight to ten years long usually, but it's been pretty consistent in that in that play, in that area. What one of the big changes that's been happening though, specifically in the U.S., but it has also been taking place in other uh, other major beef producing countries, is the efficiency of beef production per animal has been increasing steadily for many many years. So this is the U.S. data. It shows going back to about 1990. Uh, we were able to get about 740 pounds, this is in pounds, uh, of beef from a single U.S. beef animal. 
Uh, if you fast forward to the mid 2000s, uh, 2015, 2016, 2017, that, that same animal is now producing 860 pounds, 890 pounds worth of beef. And, uh, and so that's been one of the big changes that's happened over the, over the last couple uh, years, the last couple of decades, is we are just able to produce more meat with the same amount of animals. Uh, and, I, I, and that's a process that has uh, uh, taken time, and there's a number of different reasons why that has happened. Uh, one of them is herd genetics. Uh, our, our, our cattle industry looks quite closely at herd genetics and, and the genetics of the cattle uh, to, to really use some science to make sure that we are getting the most uh, – the, the, the optimal amount of meat from the animal. Uh, animal health has been a big uh, contributor to this as well. If you are losing less animals to natural to diseases, to natural uh, disasters, and anything that would that would obviously harm and ultimately kill the animal, uh, if you're if you're reducing those risks, then you're able to produce more beef from the same amount of animals, and, and you're getting reducing your losses. So that's been a big contributing factor uh, to this growth as well. I should note in the last about five years or so, you can see in the red, that growth pattern has started to level off. So there are some people in the, the industry who think we might have kind of reached a biological limit uh, for where we are with a lot of the animals we produce um, in terms of the amount of meat we can, we can get from a single animal. So that's, uh, that's something to watch uh, as we go forward. Now, if I were to compare this uh, efficiency to uh, some of the other large, really beef, large beef producing countries in the world, you'll see, you know, the U.S. is, is the most efficient on a per animal basis. Uh, but others are catching up, too. So Australia has been able to increase a lot of its uh, efficiency. New Zealand is there. Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, they're all they're all trying to make some moves uh, to be more efficient as well. So I think this is an important point to look at because there's a lot of opportunity here to still create more protein without necessarily having to add more animals, having to take more lands to, to feed those animals, we might be able to, to, to keep feeding and keep producing more protein for the human or for humans uh, just by, by taking a lot of the technology we've been able to produce in some countries, transferring it to others and, and really uh, you know, optimizing what we're, uh, what we're doing. I, I always like to point out this, uh, this slide to a lot of people in the leather industry because I don't think a lot of people in the leather industry or definitely not the fashion industry, footwear industry, think about these terms of metrics of uh, impact of an animal on how much meat it's producing because we all use, usually think about uh, one hide, one hide, one animal. So what's the environmental impact, for example, of, uh, of that hide? And, uh, and so you might look at it and say, well, an environmental impact of a hide from the U.S. is much higher than it is from Brazil. Therefore, uh, you know, the Brazilian hide must be more eco-friendly or something like that. Well, that's not taking into account another completely different metric that you're not looking at, which is food production. And that's ultimately what the cattle and the meat industry is looking at is how much food are we producing? So I like to try to interject that into our conversations in the leather industry and the fashion industry. So that people start thinking about this, that, okay, there's, there are a lot of factors at play here that you want to take into account when you're looking at hides from various regions around the world. So now if we turn uh, our, our attention to global meat demand and what's happening uh, in, in demand trends, obviously, again, this is just a very, very high level discussion. We could talk about this all day. But really, the big story here has been China and what China has been able to do in the last couple of decades in terms of bringing a lot of its people out of poverty. Uh, out of subsistence farming and into the, middle, the global middle class. And as many of you all probably know, the first thing somebody wants to do when they come out of poverty and, and move into a, a global middle class situation is add more protein to their diet. So that's the very first thing. We see that with China. We see that in other parts of Asia. And we definitely see that happening in Africa as well. As economic development takes off, more protein is going to be consumed. Um, and so that, that has really been driven by China in the last uh, couple of decades. Europe, North America, our, our protein consumption has largely leveled off. Uh, it's not in a growth phase anymore. And so it's really the, the, the emerging markets who are driving a lot of this protein growth. Uh, if I, again, just look at the USA and, and as an example on this, our, our statistics and meat consumption definitely show this. You know, we were in a growth phase up until about the early 2000s when our total meat consumption, including pork, poultry, beef, our total meat consumption kind of leveled off. You saw a dip during uh, uh, the Great Recession, the recessions of 2008, 2009. And then as the economy has recovered, so too has our overall meat consumption. However, uh, that, 
as our forecast shows, our, our, that's going to keep, continue to level off over the next several years. There's not an expectation of a, a substantial growth in U.S. Uh, per capita. Uh, one of the big things that we've seen change, at least in the U.S. diet, and I think this has happened in another, a number of other Western countries, is we have seen beef consumption going down in the U.S. So even though our uh, protein consumption has gone up and, and leveled off, a lot of what's being consumed is actually poultry meat. Uh, that has seen the most growth. And our beef consumption, our lamb consumption have decreased quite a bit. So um, since the 1970s, beef consumption per capita in the U.S. Uh, come down quite a bit. And it's now kind of leveled off at around 80, 85 uh, pounds per person per year. So uh, we kind of expect that to, to, to continue and no major changes uh, on that front. Uh, as I said at kind of the beginning of this section, though, what one of the major changes has been the driving uh, forces has been, has been what's happening in the emerging markets. So especially in Africa, especially in Asia. The, the dietary energy supply, the, the amount of calories, the amount of nutrients available has increased significantly since 2000. It's increased in a lot of other parts of the world too, but that's all, as we talked about, kind of leveled off. But you continue to see that substantial growth uh, in, in Africa and in Asia. And this has been a good thing. You know, I, I think we need to be celebrating this and thinking about this in terms of the, the human perspective, because that has brought a lot of people out of hunger, out of mal malnourishment. Animal proteins are a very good source of, uh, of all the essential nutrients, many of the essential nutrients we need as humans to survive. Um, for somebody who's been a subsistence farmer for you know forever, if they're able to add more protein into their diet, whether it's dairy or, or other meat products, uh, that helps in, in the malnourishment. So some, some sectors of the world, some regions have reduced their uh, hunger quite a bit on the back of animal proteins. Um, and so this is something we need to keep in mind, especially as we talk about sustainability and what it means to have a, a plant-based diet versus an animal protein diet. Um, we need to keep this in, in mind that the world is, is able to produce the, the, the nutrients we need to keep everybody uh, uh, fed. And that if we, met, we start tweaking with that system, which we absolutely should, we need to keep in mind that we don't want to create a situation where all of a sudden hunger is a, a a major problem again in many regions where it's been trending down. Um, I'll just give you an example uh, of where the science and this kind of thinking has gone. Uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture a couple of years ago did a, a pretty big study where they said, you know, just kind of thought study, what, what would happen to the U.S. diet if we went completely vegan, all, all protein, uh, plant proteins, no animal proteins whatsoever? What would happen? So they said, well, okay, first our, our greenhouse gas emissions could reduce by a little bit. Uh, uh, animal, animal protein production in the U.S. is about 3.5% of our greenhouse gas emissions. That comes down to about 2% of our, of our total emission, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So yeah, you would see a little bit of a, uh, a benefit there. What you would uh, also see, though, is the availability of nutrients uh, that, that the U.S. population needs plummet significantly. And so uh, there would not be the same nutrient uh, availability that the population needs. We would once again see hunger on the rise in the U.S., um, and it would have a have a detrimental effect to to our human population. So just something to keep in mind as we, as you hear about debates about uh, animal protein production, animal protein consumption. You know, are we eating too much meat in the world? These types of things. Well, put put the human perspective back into it. There's a lot of people that have come out of poverty who need that who need those nutrients. And those are the ones we don't want to send back into a, a, a hunger situation. So I, I mentioned China, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll harp on China in this uh, part of the presentation because this really is the, the main theme and the main thing that's happening globally in terms of meat demand is China is acting like a vacuum. Just vacuuming, vacuuming up protein supplies from a, a lot of different regions of the country. If any of you in the audience are at all involved in, in meat production or meat sales, international sales of meat, you probably already know this. You're probably already selling into China. Uh, you can see China barely was a, a, a beef importer even as of 10 years ago. And all of a sudden now, China's one of the largest beef importers in the world. Um, some of the South American countries like Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, 60, 70 percent of their exports are all going to China for beef. So this is a substantial change that's taking place in this market very, very quickly. Uh, the same thing's happening in pork. Uh, 
China is one of the largest pork producers in the world. It's also one of the largest pork consumers in the world. So same thing's happening. They're importing pork from wherever they can. And then obviously it's also happening on the chicken side as well. A little bit, uh, they, they do have more chicken domestically produced, but they're importing it from everywhere, uh, wherever they can find supplies. So that's that's really the big driver that's happening in, in global protein. So finally, let's turn to leather and leather industry and the reason we're all here today. So let's talk about leather's uh, connection to the meat industry and the cattle industry. Well, I think most of you all know this. Many of you all have uh, I've heard me talk about this, but leather is obviously a byproduct of meat production, of cattle production. So uh, the leather industry upcycles the hides uh, that are coming with the meat um, and turns it into a wonderful, sustainable material. So I often uh, focus on the U.S. in this because there's a lot of groups out there, I think you all know who they are, who like to say that leather is a co-product or, or sometimes you're growing animals for leather purposes. And so I like to just point to the data. And we have pretty good data in the U.S. on this. Uh, we have a report that comes out every single day from our Department of Agriculture which shows what is the percentage of each of the pieces of the animal that's not meat. How much does that, what's the value of that product compared to the overall animal? So I pulled this one on uh, October 28th, Thursday. Uh, this is the daily report. On this day, the cattle hide uh, was worth about 3.28% of the value of the entire animal, 3% of the value of the animal. There is not a, a farmer, a rancher, or a producer in the world who's raising this animal for leather production purposes, they're raising it for the meat. So without the leather industry, we're gonna have a whole lot of waste to be produced uh, that the world's gonna to have to deal with uh, if you don't have that recycling element. So that's who we are as a leather industry. We should be very proud of that. Uh, unfortunately, it is true. We, we, we do send hides to the waste stream. Um, many of you all may, may know this, but depending on which country you're coming from, for some of the, the, the larger beef producing countries, this is a little bit of a, a different concept, but uh, last year in the U.S., we estimate that about 4.8 million U.S. cattle hides did not make it into the leather, leather supply chain. So they end up in an incinerator or landfill. Or some of them might have ended up in a rendering plant, but we don't think it was a large percentage of it. So we think a lot of those hides should make it into the leather supply chain. We should be using those for uh, American footballs, footwear, upholstery, those, those types of, uh, of goods. Uh, there's also a CO2 element to this, greenhouse gas emissions element to this. Uh, we estimate that if those 4.8 million or about 5 million hides in the U.S. had uh, been sequestered in terms of leather production, we could have kept 120,000 CO2 equivalent units out of the atmosphere. So we do think that there is a, a greenhouse gas uh, component to this as well. The reason why we should be celebrating the leather industry and uh, working with it. Uh, I, I just as a thought experiment, we, just, we tried to figure out what that would look like on a global basis. How many CO2 equivalents if we were able, would we be saving if we were able to keep all hides out of the landfill globally? Uh, we estimate that about 337 million cattle hides are produced each year. This is the FAO number. Um, we estimate that about 45% of them or so, give or take, are making it into the leather supply chain currently. So that means about 150 million uh, head, or 150 million hides are not making it into the supply chain for leather, and so that's 3.3 million uh, CO2 equivalent units that have been released back into the atmosphere as opposed to being sequestered leather. So we do think that there is a, a strong climate change argument for promoting leather and using leather in the industry. So I might have gone a little late here. I, I, I thank you so much for inviting me today. I'm so sorry I can't be there, but I wish you all the best. Uh, at the World Leather Congress, and hopefully we can uh, connect in the future. So thank you very much. Okay, excellent presentation there from Steve. Just a reminder that Steve is, uh, that was a pre-recorded one, and Steve is not actually with us uh, today for any questions. Uh, I'd like to invite, invite our next speaker now, uh, Mr. Luca Boltry of Unich, to give his presentation, please. Hi. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Luca Boltri. I am the vice director of uh, Unich, uh, the Italian Tanners Association. Uh, I'm very glad to be uh, here with you uh, for the fifth World Leather Congress. Unfortunately, 
I was not able to attend uh, the Congress in presence in Addis Abeba due to uh, the uh, restrictive measures still in place about international uh, uh, movement. I would like to thank, uh, first of all, uh, the organizer of the Congress, Comesa, for uh, inviting me, for inviting me to, uh, to attend the Congress and to uh, give you a short presentation about uh, leather and uh, the luxury, uh, the luxury uh, wool. I am going to share my presentation and that's it. Let's start. So uh, let's start saying that uh, leather and luxury have always had a very close relationship. The world of leather has always prized, uh, the world of luxury has always prized leather, has always loved leather because uh, uh, luxury is uh, above all a serious, a series of concept. Uh, luxury is uh, uniqueness. Luxury product uh, is bought by a consumer also because it is a unique product, or at least uh, a product that is part of a limited group of products. So it is something related to a sort of status quo that uh, a luxury product gives to uh, to the buyer. Luxury is is emotion. Uh, Human beings are always looking for new emotion because they want to feel alive. And so luxury must give the consumer a series of different positive emotions. Luxury is ex exclusivity. Uh, a luxury product is exclusive in the sense that, as I said before about uniqueness, can give a particular um, kind of status to uh, to the buyer. Luxury is linked with well-being for sure because it is something that is not for everybody. It is something out of the ordinary. Uh, luxury is comfort. Comfort is uh, uh, an, an important positive uh, emotion, and luxury aims to give comfort to the to the consumer. Comfort that is also linked to a sense of coziness that luxury is, uh, uh, is willing to, uh, to give because it is another positive emotion. But luxury is also durability from more from a, I would say, a technical point of view. Luxury is not a, a, a one season uh, product. Uh, luxury must last for, uh, um, for a long time, it must be durable because it must be appreciated not only now but also also in the future and a luxury product must uh, last for a long a, a long period as well luxury is linked with uh, craftsmanship also because a craftsmanship craftsmanship can give this sense of exclusivity and uniqueness that luxury aims uh, aims to give as well and for sure, luxury is creativity. Creativity means uh, a product that is as a high degree of a unique uh, art given by the manufacturer. So uh, a luxury product is, is uh, often a, a unique product in terms of the creativeness that the creator has put in it. And if you think, all these characteristics are also intrinsic in leather. And this can explain this very, very close relationship. And uh, um, well, in this picture, you can see some wonderful example of luxury product made in leather because sometimes leather contributes in a unique way to transform a product into a, a luxury uh, uh, product. Um, and sometimes leather is the only manufacturing material if you want to produce a luxury product. For example, the PS5 Joypad uh, that is that you can find in in the picture. Well, Joypad is absolutely a normal good, but uh, these guys that produced this particular kind of Joypad decided to go luxury 
uh, in their joypad manufacturing. And they had to choose what kind of material can we use to make it unique, to make it, to, uh, to make it a luxury product. Well, they used gold for sure, a very precious material, and they use crocodile leather. That is one of the most uh, manufacturing material you can find in the market. The same may apply also to, for example, the uh, wonderful uh, uh, leather dress uh, of Zendaya, the famous actress. Uh, uh, she wore it during the Venice Film Festival last, uh, uh, last September. You can easily see from the picture how leather can fit uh, into the human body in a, in a unique way. It seems something like a statue, isn't it? It is something unique. It is something incredible. And the leather has some such a particular kind of uh, um, of performances that is perfect. Is perfect if you want to also give a, 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 a static and at the same time dynamic sense of moving when it is dressed uh, in such a, in such a way. But let's see a little bit. Ah, um, how leather is used in, uh, in the different market ranges of client sector. So we can see how leather is used in the high luxury segment of, uh, uh, of the sector, the industry that use leather in their manufacture. And this percentage is very, very high when uh, we see, for example, uh, um, how many high luxury shoes are made with leather, 80% on total. The same percentage applies more or less when we uh, talk about leather goods, about bags, for example. 80% of a high luxury uh, uh, bag is made with leather. The percentage is, is, uh, 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 is very high even in the, in the furniture sector. Uh, when you want to manufacture a luxury uh, sofa, for example, well, more than 60% of cases, it is a leather, a leather sofa. We don't have such a detailed data about the, 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 the leather quota in the automotive and garment sector, but we can easily say that it is extremely, extremely high as well. But leather can also, uh, uh, luxury can also uh, act as, uh, as a trendsetter, okay? Luxury, the, the, uh, the luxury industry is a trendsetter in many, in many, in many ways. In our cases, we see that the widespread and the remarkable use of leather in the luxury product ranges of client sectors, so in the luxury shoes and luxury bed, also stimulates the other ranges of products to use it. It is something uh, about, you know, the aspiration of, for example, medium uh, ranges product to, uh, to increase the value of the product, to, uh, to, go, to, to, to enter into the uh, high and luxury ranges and the leather is the perfect material to use if you want to uh, make a product that can be placed in the luxury in the luxury segment but let's see what is the value of the uh, luxury good markets well uh, when we talk about fashionally uh, fashion luxury goods market so we talk about footwear leather goods accessory apparel watches and so on um, uh, the main market analysts say that the total value, the total global value in 2019, so before the pandemic, uh, it was about, uh, you know, it, it was between 310 and 380 billion US dollars, according to uh, the, the, the different analysts. Uh, COVID-19 uh, um, consequence was a decrease in the value of, uh, of the sector. This can be easily uh, imagined. Uh, it is estimated that the decrease was about 22% on total. So the value of uh, uh, this industry, this market in 2020, was estimated to, to be uh, between 250 and 300 billion US dollar. Um, the main analyst during the spring summer also uh, tried to picture two possible uh, scenarios for recovery because everybody was for sure uh, looking for uh, for uh, you know, for recovery to getting back to normality, there are two main, uh, two main scenario uh, depicted by by the analyst. One uh, saying that uh, a full recovery of the industry 
uh, could take place at the end of the current year, uh, while another um, group of analysts uh, who were a little bit more pessimistic saying that at the end of the current year, the market uh, would probably be uh, five to 10% lower, the level of value recorded in 2019, and a full recovery could only take place in next year. Uh, well, the sales result uh, uh, registered during the first half of the current uh, of the current year uh, seems to be so positive that even the most optimistic scenario that I just described would be probably overtaken. Because if you look to the uh, first semester result, for example, of the main luxury uh, brand groups like Caring, like LVMH, like Hermes. Well, they show very, very huge uh, double digit growth. So we expect that they probably get back to the level uh, of sale uh, um, recorded before the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, what are the, 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 the reason of these very good results? Well, first of all, uh, the uh, consumption rate uh, re registered in China. China was, uh, has been has been a boost in terms of luxury consumption, even uh, during the current year, then followed by US consumption of luxury goods and then uh, European, uh, European region. If you look to the key channels about, sale, uh, about sales for uh, luxury products, we have recorded a big rise in, uh, in online sale, and this was the main driver of the sale during the, uh, the recent period while the other big channel for luxury sale, that is tourism, uh, well, there is only a partial comeback, you, uh, you know it, of tourism, uh, mainly on an uh, interregional uh, inter uh, base. Uh, US consumer may, uh, were uh, the most active consumer in this specific, uh, in this specific, in this specific channel. Um, but what is, uh, uh, what about the use of leather in the, the uh, fashion luxury uh, goods market? Well, uh, analyst estimates that one third of the fashion luxury goods are made in leather. And we can divide it, this, uh, this share into the high hand luxury goods in leather and the access, accessible luxury goods in leather. So two different segments inside the, uh, the uh, luxury, the whole luxury segment. 60% is represented by the uh, accessible uh, luxury goods in leather and 40% by the high hand luxury goods. But what is, uh, how can we you know, divide high hand luxury from accessible luxury? And this slide can give you a practical idea in terms of brands operating in, uh, in, the, two, in the two segments. So Hermes, Bottega Veneta, Dior, Chanel, Prada, Louis Vuitton, Gucci, and Barbary are brands uh, uh, placed in the high-end segment, while Tory Burch, Mulberry, Lancel, Michael Kors, Coach, Kate Spade, are seen as player in the accessible uh, or affordable uh, luxury segment. There is a division, it is a, it is a pyramid, so it is not, uh, how can I say, a, 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 an absolute uh, uh, division, it is something fluid. So you can also see some, for example, Michael Kors uh, products that can, you know, be easily placed in the high end uh, uh, luxury. The division is, uh, uh, can be assessed uh, in two terms, for example, where we, we, we use the terms for, for simplicity. One is the point of sale for these brands. Uh, the, uh, uh, the highest range, the, uh, the brand is located, the fewer points of sale he, uh, he has, while on the opposite, the accessible luxury products have many points of sale as compared to the high end. Another uh, um, level of uh, uh, differentiation is, for example, the average price for a, uh, for a bag and the 1,500 uh, uh, US dollar is seen as the threshold for, for this division. 
Now let's see it from uh, the point of view. Let's see the, the, the fashion luxury world from the point of view of tanneries. And let's see uh, what is the world consumption of leather in the main fashion luxury se uh, sectors. If you look to, um, to the leather goods sector and we analyze the, uh, the production of leather for luxury leather goods, in 2019, it was estimated that the, uh, the accessible luxury uh, segment of leather goods uh, consumed 52 million square meter of leather, 28 million consumed by the high-end luxury. In total, it is 8 million um, square meter of finished leather consumed by, uh, by leather goods. Due to the pandemic, the decrease was about 50, 42 million square meter for accessible last rate 23 for high hand. If you look to, uh, to the footwear sector, uh, the numbers are a little bit lower. In 2019, the accessible uh, luxury uh, production of shoes consumed 22 million square meter totally, consumed 22 million square meter of finished leather, 90 million consumed by the high hand, uh, uh, by the high hand legs. And these 17 and eight are the figures regarding 20, uh, 2020. The general forecast for the consumption of leather in the uh, luxury leather goods and in the luxury footwear sector are still positive for the next year, according to the, uh, to the main analyst estimates. The compound annual growth for, uh, for both of them together will be nearly 4% up to 2025. Uh, this leather comes mainly from tanneries located in uh, European, uh, in European Union. Italy, uh, French tanneries, uh, Spain tanneries, but also tanneries placed outside uh, Europe, for sure on a, uh, on a lower degree. Um, but what kind of leather is consumed by the main fashion luxury uh, sector? Uh, in this case, the division is between segments, so high-end luxury and accessible luxury. And uh, uh, if you look to the leather for high-end luxury, well, 44% is estimated to be bovine leather, 30% calf leather, 24% sheep and goat leather, mainly lamb leather, and the remaining 2% um, exotic, uh, exotic leather. On the uh, accessible luxury segment, the quota of bovine leather is much higher. 77% of the leather sold for accessible luxury uh, fashion segments comes from bovine animal, 10% calf, and 30% shipping. The quota of bovine leather in both segments uh, has increased uh, um, remarkably in the, in the recent year, mainly thanks to the minor prices, for sure, because even luxury producer uh, are willing to spend uh, as low as they can, for sure. This is normal, this is the market. And uh, bovine leather as average in manual prices as compared to calf and sheep goat, when you talk about luxury, for sure. But also because the versatility that bovine leather can uh, have and can give uh, to the manufacturing of luxury product. The uh, quote about uh, exotic uh, uh, leather consumption um, is about 2%, I said it, uh, it is not that much. There is a little, uh, a little uncertainty about the use of exotic leather and exotic leather uh, production, but we see uh, this 2% as quite stable uh, even in uh, the future. This is our, our hope because exotic leather is for sure a very important uh, part of uh, the, leather, uh, the leather production. Let's change, uh, let's change the industry and uh, let's see uh, what about the, uh, the furniture industry. Uh, um, estimates say that uh, in 2019, uh, the consumption of leather by the luxury segments of furniture manufacturing was about 22 million square, or, uh, square meter of finished leather worldwide. The decrease in 2020 was uh, very limited. And uh, this is mainly because, uh, as, uh, uh, as you have probably seen from the you know, general market picture, uh, the fact that the people were obliged to stay at home uh, more time than in the past because they, you know, they cannot move to go to the office, to go, to go outside, this was a boost for uh, the house products consumption. 
and this includes for, so, for, for, for sure the consumption of a sofa, of a chair that are also made with, uh, with leather. Uh, if you get a little bit into the details, uh, the leather for uh, uh, luxury upholstery analysis, well, this includes uh, uh, the residential segment and the contract segment. And if I said before, the former uh, 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 supported the leather consumption quite remarkably in 2020. Unfortunately, the latter suffered from the postponing of contract, uh, contract project. General Fox, uh, forecasts show stability for this kind of leather consumption in the next year. Okay, now let's, uh, let's see briefly, what about the future? Because uh, uh, we, we have seen, and uh, at, at the beginning of the presentation, and also according to Wiktionary, that the term leather is linked with some very specific concepts like well-being, wealthy, uh, uh, comfort, uh, uh, desire, something for sure that is expensive, and uh, the fact that it is something the electric good is something that is pleasant but not necessary for life. Okay, according to analysts, the uh, um, the meaning of luxury is currently being redefined by the new generation of consumer. We are going from a, a concept of a luxury that was very that is very linked has been very linked to the product excellence and all the concepts that we have listed so far with aspiration. And now we are, uh, we are going through a new concept like emotional experience, like self-expression and social impact, sustainability. These will be the new key areas uh, for uh, luxury production and luxury uh, consumption. So today consumers, so uh, uh, when they buy and when they will buy in the future a luxury product, they will sure look for quality, as always, durability, craftsmanship, the uh, performing and precious materials, but uh, uh, they will look also for some uh, transcendent uh, uh, um, messages uh, given by the luxury product. The most important one is environmental uh, uh, sustainability. So in the upcoming ages of disruption, and sources of competitive adventures by the uh, different luxury player, environmental and social sustainability is expected to have on fashion luxury the same impact that uh, the digital re revolution uh, had some years ago. Some analysts, are say, some analysts are saying that sustainability is the new revolution, sustainability is the new, is, is the new digital. It is, sustainability is something and will be something that um, the, uh, a luxury product must have, not a nice to have, but it will be a need. 60% of consumer nowadays consider the use of sustainable materials to be an important purchasing factor. And uh, this is really important even, uh, and mostly in the, in the, in the luxury, in the luxury uh, uh, industry. So we are talking about uh, an updated conception of luxury, that will include sustainability, luxury, and the, the quality that is expected to, uh, to be inside a luxury, a luxury product. As we are going through, uh, uh, towards a, um, a generation of activist consumers that are set to drive 180% of the growth in this market from 2019 to 2025, and they will place, as I said, an unprecedented emphasis on sustainability and environmental, uh, environmental uh, issue. And uh, we are not talking about uh, a limited quota of consumers of luxury products. We are talking about millennials and Jay-Z that uh, um, are nowadays making up 30% of all the luxury uh, uh, shoppers and are going to represent from 45 to 6% of this market consumption by 2025. Many analysts say that brand purpose and responsibility are and will be more and more not ne negotiable anymore. So we are going to a new luxury paradigm. We, we will be talking more and more about sustainable luxury. This will be the luxury in the future. And we as Tanner have the uh, need to go uh, in this direction as well. If we want that leather will be the preferred material for 
a luxury product manufacturing even in the future. Thank you very much. And I hope you will have a very profitable Congress. So, bye. Thank you, Luca, for an absolutely fascinating insight into uh, the role of leather in the luxury sector. Um, quite a lot to take out of that. I'm very conscious that of time here. We're, we're currently running 20 minutes over. Um, I would like to ask both Luca and Ernest uh, Wondu uh, a question each. Um, and then I think we have some flexible time at the end of the day that we can run into if we start to run over with the other presentations. Uh, Luca, you talked about sustainability there as a key driver for the current and future consumption of luxury goods. What's the implications there for the tanning sector? Um, well, uh, first of all, hi everybody. Well, uh, I don't know if you if you see, but it, this was a pre-recorded <laughs> uh, presentation. I was ready to make it live, but I think that due to some technical problems, that was better choice right now uh, today. Well, uh, su sustainability is uh, uh, is a key issue uh, even right now for all the tanning industry, and uh, it is not something that. Uh, you know, was born yesterday. It was something that the tanning industry has to deal with for quite a long time. I would say at least 10, 15 years uh, ago. And uh, for sure, the luxury, the luxury segment um, has always been, uh, as I said in the presentation, like a trendsetter on this, uh, on this concern in terms of, you know, uh, requesting more and more guarantees about the environmental performances of tanneries, about the social performances inside tanneries, about the ethical part of the production. So we are talking about uh, traceability, we are talking about transparency in the supply chain. We are talking about taking care also about, you know, topics that seems quite far from from a tanning industry like animal welfare okay as uh, as uh, as steve said in his uh, in his intervention uh, and it's something that everybody in the in the market knows very well um uh, we are uh, reusing a, a, a byproduct we are recycling a byproduct so we cannot uh, control our the upstream part of of our industry so we cannot really drive uh, uh, the farming systems we are we cannot really drive um, all the condition in which for example the animals are, uh, are raised but anyway our clients are, are requesting us to give them some guarantees about for example the well-being of, of animals and so we have we we need to take charge of this uh, we also you know uh, need to deal with uh, you know issues related to deforestation is also about ethical and even in this case like animal welfare we cannot really drive the change if a change is needed and uh, our clients are you know are conveying to us uh, sometimes they need to change something in our in our supply chains and this is uh, you know this uh, mm, uh, this uh, push coming from mainly from uh, from the luxury brands because luxury brands are the uh, among our clients they are probably the most exposed in terms of visibility to public opinion so they are even i can say they are weak uh, when uh, they they are attacked by you know like uh, any kind of enemies of the leather industry, of the tanning industry. We're talking about animalist association, radical groups, and uh, um, and this kind of uh, uh, opinion movement. Uh, and this is a, this implies all the uh, different aspects uh, uh, that compose sustainability in tanning and leather production. So we are talking about, for example, if we talk about chemical management, the luxury sector, the luxury brand sector have set all all of them have set their own uh, you know like requirements chemical requirements in terms of substances in terms of uh, uh, of limits in terms of, me of me methodologies um, they ask and they, they request information about the environmental impact in terms of uh, consumption of waters in terms of consumption of chemicals and they are all asking improvement on this concern so um, this is something that uh, uh, it is fundamental. It is a fundamental issues for uh, uh, today's tanner and for future tanneries. I think that as, as we have seen in the, in the presentation, this trend will go on and will increase in terms of, uh, of request. We 
I think we all hope that the requests are, you know, are and will be feasible because sometimes we are requested to give information or to improve performances that are, you know, quite impossible to, 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 to get. But for sure, uh, we need to, you know, to improve all of our, our efforts on this concern as much as, much as we can, as uh, we need we need to keep ladder inside the uh, sourcing supply chain, the, the, the supply chain of the luxury brands. Because as I said, luxury is a trendsetter. If a luxury brands keeps using leather, even the medium to low, the medium to high ranges of uh, fashion manufacturers, furniture manufacturers, even automotive manufacturers, they will keep on using leather as well. Thank you very much. Um... I think we're now going into a 15 minute break, uh, which will see us back at 25 past 12 in Ethiopia for the next session. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Kerry. Uh, uh, as Dr. As Dr. Kerry said, 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 we will break for. 15 minutes, but in this break time, we have a great uh, uh, sporting people that will uh, show us some exercise. So relax, you are kindly invited to come uh, forward. Thank you. We are about a little bit of oxygen. To enhance your oxygen levels, some exercises are here. Please stand. 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 Please stand. Please stand. Please stand. Please stand. Please stand. You, you can't walk, you can't walk around your table. First, inhale, one step, inhale, three step, exhale. You can't walk around. Breathe in. Breathe in. One step. Breathe out. Three steps. Shoulder wide, shoulder wide. Bend your knees slightly, bend your knees slightly. Abdomen and in, chest high, back straight, chin up and look forward. This is good posture. Breathe in deeply, then breathe out your mouth.
One. Nice, two. Keep going. Three. Shoulder wide. Bend your knees. Abdominal in. Chest high. Back straight. Chin up and look forward. Breathe in and breathe out. Deeply. And two more. One more. And shake. 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 You hand your leg. Shake. 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 Check and stop. Back to the previous position. Shoulder wide. Don't open your leg like this. Not like this. Just open your leg, shoulder wide. Then bend your knees. Abdominal in, chest high, back stretching up, look forward. Then breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Then breathe out. Breathe in, then breathe out. Go, keep going. Yes, keep going. Breathe in deeply, then breathe out deeply. Yes. Five more. Four more. Three more. Two more. One more. And then shake. 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 Nice. Shake. Shake. Total body shake. 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 Nice. Good job. Jump. Shake. Shake. Nice. Stop. And breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out smoothly. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out smoothly. Smoothly. The last one, one more set, one more set. Shoulder wide. Bend your wrist slightly. Abdominal in, back straight. Then chest high, chin up and look forward. This is good posture. S shape is good posture, not like, like me, <laughs> like her. Okay, breathing deeply. Then, breathe in, then this is exercise to increase your oxygen level inside your heart and lung and your brain when you can perform. Keep going. Five. Four, three, two, one more. And shake, shake, good job. Shake, 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 shake. Nice. Breathing without smooth. Breathing without smooth. Nose and mouth. Breathe in by your nose deeply. Breathe out by your mouth extremely. Nice. 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 Relax. 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 Breathe in when you go up. Breathe out when you go down. One. Go. The position is the same. Shoulder wide, like that. The previous one. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. 
is out with a touch. Down. It's in. When you go up, it's in. When it is out. When you go down. Yes, good job. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Then relax. 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 Nice. Let's go to your shoulder. Hold it. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Smoothly. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Nice. Good job. Breathe in. Breathe out. Five. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Nice. Breathe in, three, two, one. Then relax, 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 relax. Okay, chest high. Then rotate your shoulder. Breathe in. Breathe out. Yes. Try to hold your chest high. Yes. Not alternate, it's bigger. Breathe in. Breathe out. Yes. Rotate your shoulder. Yes. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Two more. One more. Nice, relax, relax. Opposite. Out, go. Breathe in, breathe out. Don't forget, breathing technique is very important for energy. Yes. Nice, nice. It's also side massage. Go, 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 go. go. Go, come on. One more. Relax. 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 Knee up. One. Two. Three. Exhale. One in here. Like the, fir the first technique. Go. Five. Knee up. Knee up. Knee up. Exhale. Inhale. Knee up. Exhale. 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 Inhale. Exhale. 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 Inhale. Exhale. Keep your balance. Exhale. And inhale. Five. Exhale. Exhale, exhale, inhale. Exhale, 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 inhale. One more. Exhale, 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 inhale. Good job. Today is breathing technique. Next time, flexibility. We will do. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks a lot uh, for this physical exercise. It really refreshes us. Uh,
Christ's virtue.